Good morning. Thank you for attending. Uh, this is 3D Printing and Makerspaces and Libraries. I'm Jesse Severe. I am Marketing and Multimedia Specialist at the Wyoming State Library. And uh, we were fortunate enough to get a 3D printer uh, sometime this summer, about three months ago, I think. And I wanted to uh, let everybody know about it. So anyway, we're going to talk today a little bit about 3D printers, um, also Makerspaces and uh, some easy ways for you guys to get started if it's a path you want to go down. You'll notice here in the bottom right hand corner I have a video that's going to play over top and uh, it's it's an actual print that that we did yesterday and it is moving pretty quick you'll notice that that's at two and a half times regular pace so this print overall took about an hour and a half and today I think it's going to be 34 minutes so you can watch that. I'm not going to tell you what it is yet, but you should be able to get it pretty quick. So anyway, that'll be something you can look at. All right, so the printer. This is the printer that we have here at the Wyoming State Library. This is a hobbyist model. Oh yeah, I wanted to say real quick, um, if any of you have any questions throughout this, just go ahead and type them in the chat box and I'll address them uh, at the end of this. So uh, feel free to put that in there. But anyway, back to the printer. This is the MakerBot Replicator 2. It's made by MakerBot Industries out of Brooklyn, New York. Um, it's a second generation model. Their first one was more of a hobbyist model than this, as in it was laser cut out of wood and you could actually download, if you had a laser table, you could download the files, use some small plywood and actually assemble it yourself they would send you the gantry files or the, the gantry parts and you'd put it together that way. So they learned a lot from that and they've since developed this model which is a desktop um, hobbyist model. It runs $2,200 as of uh, actually yesterday, I double checked that. They have a couple other things that they manufacture but this is right now kind of their workhorse in the industry. So we picked this one mainly because it is uh, used by a lot of people. Its user base is pretty large. It has a lot of community support because of that. So if there's anything that goes wrong with it, there uh, is a huge community forum, a um, lot of places where you can basically ask your question and chances are somebody's already answered that for you. It's fairly simple. This technology is an additive process. It's the most popular right now. So um, not a ton of moving parts and it's definitely user serviceable and replacement parts are available in model format so you can actually print a lot of your own replacement parts but beyond that the company's great to deal with and they can get you things in the mail right away so with this model um, this is the print head basically you're looking at a, it's almost like a hot glue gun uh, on a printer head on, on rails so the extrusion process, there's a filament that comes through, which I'll show you here in a second. Through that tube in the top, it goes down into the print head, which it heats it up to 230 degrees Celsius, which is 446 Fahrenheit. So the actual nozzle itself, which you can barely see right here, is just like a hot glue gun. That gets really hot, but the rest of it does not. So I, I really think it's, uh, you know, it's extremely safe. So the gantry itself, which is the left and right mechanism, is like a home paper printer. And a lot of the earliest models of people making these, they used hardware from printers. So we can see here the print axis is, as we discuss them. There's X and Y, which is left and right, and then up and down from that angle. So combining those, you can make a circle, which you can see in our video at the bottom it's basically printing a, a series of circles and then your z-axis is the blue plate which is the build plate and that goes up and down to create your z-axis for your third dimension so as the plate drops it'll do another pass plate drops does another pass and that's how you end up with a three-dimensional object so the code that runs this machine is called g-code it's universal across most 3D mechanisms, whether it be a CNC router or um, 3D printer, a lot of those things. 
And then you can see on the build plate that there is a blue tape. That is actually just blue painter's tape. The plate itself is Lexan. Uh, they make a lot of different ones. You can get aluminum or, or whatever. But the blue painter's tape allows the, the filament to stick to it, but it also allows you to be able to get it off. My first print, <laughs> actually, I printed directly on the Lexan and it stuck really, really hard. I actually had to get it off with a hammer. So since then I've used the tape. So the filament itself is called PLA, polylactic acid. It is a renewable resource, um, or renewable plastic, so to speak. It uses a vegetable base. In the US, I believe it's, or it's mostly corn, but I do understand in other places they use uh, sugar cane starch, a couple other things. So it is, um, the most popular right now, ABS is the other plastic that can be used, but our print head that we have on this one doesn't actually facilitate that. This, um, in its finished form, is extremely strong. It can be a little bit brittle, so sharp impacts, it's not perfect for that, but um, it, it, a lot of the models you'd be tasked to try to break it with your hands. It comes in a lot of colors, as you can see. Um, they make a glow-in-the-dark one that I guess has been popular this this Halloween season. And then uh, for chemistry, that's the overall model. So you'll have to correct me if that's that's wrong. I just pulled that off the internet. This is the control panel. This is the brain of the unit, uh, the lower right hand side of the model, or the, of the actual printer. Pretty simple, you have a nice screen, uh, SD card, and uh, uh, four way buttons with a main input really really basic the thing I like about this is you don't actually have to have a computer to run a print it runs off an SD card so you stick that in your computer use the modeling software and then you're able to basically run this thing off just a extension cord or a plug-in and one of the things that I enjoy about this model is it's conversational so you can see it talks to you there like it's a person it says I'm it refers to itself as I you know, my print head, uh, my filament, things like that. So it makes it really, really easy. When I received this printer, the SD card was already in it with models loaded, and I was able to get my first print started in about four minutes. So it's really, really user-friendly and easy to use. So MakerBot Industries has uh, their website called Thingiverse, this is kind of their online repository of their users' models. They allow you to upload things that you've created, uh, allow you to shop through these and download the models of whatever you like to try, and it's completely free. So a lot of what I've printed so far have came off of this website, and it's it, it's been really neat to see some of the models out there and some of the things that work and some of the things that don't necessarily work but there's comments so it really is a community and you can see the basket there in the image that's actually not what's being printed just to give you a heads up on that but it's kinda neat you can upload your own models and get uh, feedback there's a lot of tips for how to print so you know these machines are configurable you can change the speed of the print head you can change the rate of flow you can do a lot of those things and they'll Basically, the community can help you troubleshoot some of those issues in that way. This is MakerWare. This is the software that they supply with this printer. Now, I'm, I will say that other printers have their own software, and I'm not familiar with that necessarily. This is the, the printer that I've been using and working on, so this is the software that I'm most familiar with. I know that there's some other software, like Replicator G, which is also open source. Um, this is free software so you can see the model that I downloaded from Thingiverse I have it there on the build plate so you can scale it you can make it larger smaller um, you know 3d orbit and now you can uh, basically do a preview and it'll give you an idea of how much uh, filament you're gonna use or how long the print should take so then you export that using the make button and it gives you options here so you can change the resolution of the print, which is low, standard high, and basically that just changes the thickness of each layer. The model that you'll see printing in the bottom right-hand corner 
that's printing at the lowest or the lowest resolution, which makes it print faster. But the quality turns out really, really well. I'll show you a finished uh, image, and you can see that even low is still really, really nice looking. So the next thing is SketchUp. And this is what I've personally chosen to use for my 3D modeling. You can use any CAD software to create your 3D models. And so, but I've used this because it is um, very, very user friendly. It's open source again. This is a product that Google actually um, had a part in developing. And an interesting story behind that is when they developed Google Earth, they wanted to have users go in and be able to model buildings or landmarks in their area so that way they could populate the Google Earth map with actual 3D models that you could see when you browsed it. So they created a simple, easy to use 3D modeling software. Well, people realized pretty quickly that it was really powerful for a lot of other things. So it's kind of transitioned into a different role as just a general purpose 3D modeling software. So I'm going to show you uh, a quick demo. This is actually live. This is a uh, model that I put together. This is the Wyoming State flag. And the reason I picked this is because it's in three basic colors, red, white, and blue. And we happen to have those, so I thought it'd be kind of neat to model this. So. I started with the with a uh, a JPEG of the flag on the build plate or on the uh, the the origin, and then from there I was able to trace the image, and so inside of here, you can actually lift things just like that um, in and out, and then I created these plates to correspond with the three different colors. So it's really, really easy to use, and I, for anybody that's interested in this stuff, I would definitely recommend giving it a shot. So back to this, I can show you what, this is the actual printed model of what I designed in SketchUp. I was able to export that to a language that the printer would understand, and I was able to basically do the three different prints in the three different colors, and they nest inside of each other to create the finished model. I'm still working on it. It's, um, I think that you can see my keyboard in the background. It's about three and a half to four inches wide. And my goal is to be able to scale it up and down. I don't know, maybe a keychain or something like that. But it was really more about me learning how to use the software. So, some other 3D printing technology. Um, basically more awesome stuff. This certainly isn't the oldest technology out there as far as 3D printing goes. This additive process that you can see in the bottom right hand corner. But um, this is what's popular right now for hobbyists. For industrial use, for you know other areas, they use different technology and we'll explore some of that. So this is dual extrusion. As you can see there in the top picture, there's two extruders on the same print head. So basically you can print two different colors of filament at the same time. You can also print two different kinds of filament at the same time if you have it calibrated correctly. The model that we're looking at right now, or the model of printer we're looking at right now is the MakerBot 2X which is the experimental and I believe it prints primarily in ABS. It can also do PLA but um, in this case, uh, I believe it's an enclosed, so it uses ABS primarily. And also, it can use support material, which I'll get to. Actually, we can do that right now. So if you look at the bottom example with dissolvable filament, it basically can print the two different materials at the same time. So it'll print the ABS or PLA plastic, and then it'll have the dissolvable PLA in there and then when you're done with it you can put it into a household solvent it's you know mostly non-toxic or completely non-toxic actually I should say and as it dissolves then you have a model that is completely movable so in this instance it's a bearing and the ball bearings are loose from the rest thanks to that dissolvable filament in the top image it's a it's a flexible PLA which they just came out with these are only a couple weeks old the, the technology or the, or the availability of the public anyway. And so it 
it has a, a workable point a workable um, temperature of like 180 degrees so you can put this in warm to boiling water and then pull it out and it has a few minutes where you can move the plastic and then as it cools it hardens so I have not uh, used any of these yet like I say they're fairly new and then PVA is another um, I believe it's water soluble and I I, I don't know I, again I haven't used that one so but those are some other technologies that are available so other 3d printers on the market um, like I say we went with the the replicator 2 which is around twenty two hundred dollars there are other ones that are much more affordable and there's others that are much more expensive these are three of the examples that that I thought were pretty relevant the the pricing point on them is all you know very affordable but there's a few caveats for some of them the Cubify Cube I believe the build plate is quite a bit smaller than what these others are and the Mendel Max is a true hobbyist model where you have to assemble it um, doesn't necessarily come shipped ready to use like the the replicator 2 does but there are a lot of options out there and like I say I'm familiar with the one that we use and then there's my cheapskate pick which is the three do three doodler for 99 bucks it's certainly not computer aided it's more like a pen um, that uses the same filament it actually uses sticks of it this was a Kickstarter project um, that was funded successfully. I don't know if they've started shipping these yet, but you could become a backer for $99. And I think it's pretty neat. I think in a library situation for a makerspace, you could actually get a lot of mileage out of these for not very much money. These are some of the models that the Kickstarter campaign showed that people have done with these. but. I think there's a lot of room. This isn't technically computer-aided uh, 3D printing, but as far as creativity goes, I think it's pretty awesome. So some other 3D printing technology. This is SLA. This one has been around since the mid-80s, and this is certainly more of an industrial um, thing. So there's a vat of liquid polymer, and then you have a build plate that moves up and down inside that. And then there's a laser that basically hardens a layer at a time what's at the surface and then the build plate drops by a degree and then the laser exposes another uh, layer and it goes down and down and down and so more or less something happens and then these come out of the machine so this has been used for rapid prototyping for a long time but the technology is is interesting but it's it's not something that I'm familiar with personally because these machines are really really expensive so we're sticking with the additive process this is another one that you'll actually see in practice more often than the previous and it uses uh, powder and so you see the wheels roll a layer of powder across the the build plane and then a laser comes in and hardens the top layer of powder the table drops and then another layer of powder comes across and there's another technology similar to this that uses a print head and it sprays like a glue hardener on the surface as it goes so again something happens this comes out of the machine I will say that on the model on the right there's something you can definitely do there that we can't if you look down here on our video there's a there's a, a span here and the the printer as it goes across that gravity takes hold of the PLA and it can try to pull that down so they've had a challenge trying to figure out how to modify the software to be able to bridge that gap as fast as possible, to be able to uh, keep that sag down to minimal. But if you have a model that's like six inches wide and you have a bridge that it has to do, you, you have to make concessions in the way that you build that. There's support material that can be put in there to basically assist that, that then is removed later. But in the case of this, because this is being built in a layer of powder, as it goes down, you can do a lot of things that you can't do with the additive process. So, for instance, these overhangs here, you wouldn't be able to do that with the process below, but using this powder. So there are advantages to these technologies. These printers, I think, started around 8,000. So, why would your library want to do this, and what does this mean to a library? 
at our library here at the Wyoming State Library, we have a patent and trademark resource center, and we have potential patent seekers come in, and if they want to explore um, actual production, they may want to look at rapid prototyping, and basically to be able to see if their model is functional in a, in the real world. So we could take uh, a model like this, which we had pulled. It's from 1918 and is an actual Wyoming patent application. We could take this and put it into a 3D model and then actually have it printed. I have not done that. Um, I, something that I would like to do is actually go back through the archives that we have and, and pull some models and put them into the 3D world. But there's somebody out there that has been doing this. I found an article about a guy that took a bunch of uh, old, old patents and would basically then model them for printing. So this I thought was interesting. That's his model of it. And it took me a while to figure out, but he said it's, it's a bookmark that you can then clip your pen into, into the top of it. This is another patent that he modeled um, after. This is a hat clip that basically allows ladies to keep uh, their hat on their head in the in the wind. So rapid prototyping, uh, we discussed. I had a little bit of experience with this. My lawnmower this summer, actually, the wing nut that holds the bars together broke, and I was thinking, I'm like, okay, now what do I do? Do I call the company and say, you know, I need a replacement part for this, or you know what do I do? So what I did is I took the I took the the working one and I got my uh, tape measure and calipers out and I measured it and this I modeled in in SketchUp. That models that's a screenshot of the actual thing that I produced and then this is the finished model and that and it worked perfectly. I actually it, it I have it on my lawnmower right now so it's working perfect. And let me show you. These are the side by side of the factory one on the right and the one that I produced on the left. And if you couldn't tell, I made this one. So on to maker spaces. So if you can't tell, the, the model at the bottom right hand, by the way, is a jack-o'-lantern. I thought that was pretty neat. It's fully customizable. Uh, I was able to pick the eyes, the nose, the mouth that I wanted. This came off Thingiverse. Um, like I say, the whole model takes about an hour and a half to print and uh, we've sped it up here for about 34 minutes so maker spaces what is a maker space this is one of the best definitions I've found uh, basically a creative space where people can come together and share ideas and, and learn about making things this is a pretty drastic example of how a library is, is taking over um, some of their space to create a makerspace. This is a program that they called Stacks to Hacks, and they actually took out some book stacks and built this uh, interactive space. You can see the 3D printer there in the center of the screen. That is actually the first MakerBot model that they had. You can see it's made out of wood. And then on the left, they're using a screen printing process to uh, do like t-shirts it looks like and then the top middle uh, oh by the way this is Detroit public I should mention the top center they are uh, doing some breadboarding and, and programming so from IMLS this is a statement of support definitely so I won't read the whole thing but basically IMLS is behind the concept of using makerspace as an opportunity to teach and educate and also set up visitors um, for success as a lot of people say that there's pretty high consensus about basically looks like my model might have dropped out for a second oh yeah I did a I did a, a cold pause to um, I had to print this at two different times so you'll see a pause here it comes back all right so basically they say that there's going to be a lot of new technologies um, that our youth need to be at least educated about in the future. So having a makerspace with some of these things that people can get hands-on that they can't necessarily afford for their own use uh, allows people to get familiar with these things. So an example that I like to think about is a 
copier or a fax machine. At, at one point, the libraries the libraries were the place that people would go to actually uh, experience those things. So why is this important? I kind of touched on that for a second, but educational opportunities. To allow uh, people to come into your library and learn about things that potentially have a role in the future and you know there could be a lot of jobs and positions that that will use these technologies and so learning about them early is important also just uh, encouraging creativity having people uh, express themselves using these things you know so a service to the community um, you know without these at home there are times that for my example of printing or the wing nut for my model. So if I wouldn't have had a 3D printer here, I would have had to have gone somewhere, uh, probably paid. Some libraries do offer these throughout the country, not here where we are, but they charge basically based on the amount of uh, filament that you use. So they weigh the object. But that's a service that, that, that I could have gone and used if our library offered it. And then if the library doesn't take this project on, who will? So I do know that a lot of schools are using these, uh, which I think is awesome. I think that's really important. But at a certain point, not everybody can access their, their local school. So if you know, you're an adult that's out of school or if you're someone that's homeschooled, the library has an opportunity to basically offer these to their patrons. And uh, you know there aren't a lot of people necessarily that are going to be taking these projects on out of the kindness of their heart. So, how to get started. Or we want one, now what do we do? So step one, create a place for people to come together and create awesome stuff. And honestly, I don't really have a step two <laughs> to that. I think that this is the most important part. And the reason I say I don't have a step two for this is because every library is going to be different. Every library is going to be able to take it on at a different scale. There are a lot of available technologies besides 3D printers. Um, I think this is the one that we're seeing the most of. They're kind of the hot thing right now. But there's also things like laser cutters. Uh, they're called optical beds in a lot of situations. And they're, they're a little bit more expensive. You can get into them for about the price of a, a good 3D printer. But it allows people to cut things out. Um, that can then be assembled into 3D models if they want to do that. I've seen a lot of custom game boards made with these so it allows uh, an outlet for creativity um, an but another tool and they can work in conjunction as well. There's, there's things that you can do with 3D printers that are augmented by things that you can do with laser cutters. CNC machines are another big one. This is a pretty simple two-axis CNC machine. You can see it uses like a Dremel tool uh, cutting head and it moves on the X and Y axis. There are ones that do a lot more intricate things but this model here runs about $1200 versus the, the fully you know optimized ones that can be thousands and thousands. So the reason I bring this up is because these these are not exactly affordable technologies in all instances. So if you're not ready for that type of a uh, expenditure, this is a really good example I've seen of a small library. Um, it's basically a cabinet with a bunch of tools and a bunch of things that people can use to build with. This is truly the makerspace model versus saying you have to have a certain technology or a certain expensive thing. But encouraging people to build things um, I think is important. And a lot of libraries already have craft spaces that basically have a lot of these things, but to add on to that, you know, with a workbench and then to add the opportunity for the technologies as your library sees fit is really, really important. So this is an example, Johnson County Library in Kansas. I like this one. You can see they have the MakerBot Replicator 2, uh, just like we do, but they have it on a on a simple stand with the filament below it and uh, like I said that printer is twenty two hundred dollars and the PLA filament that you can see down below those run between 
$48 if you buy it directly from Makerware and we've actually purchased some of ours on Amazon for $35 uh, and I have to be honest, I have hundreds of hours on this printer and we haven't even ran through one entire spool of any particular color. But a couple of the other things I like that they did is they have a uh, soldering station. So with technologies like Arduino, programmable circuit boards, um, Raspberry Pi, which is another circuit board, you can uh, basically talk about you know circuitry and different things it kind of crosses the line between necessarily just crafting and painting as to getting into some more technologies and then I thought the bottom was really neat that was something I hadn't thought of but a uh, a video green screen um, area for for video projects so as you can see this isn't a lot of expenditure here and they have a pretty there, there's a lot of options there so in closing uh, I think 3D printers are awesome. I think that they're really, really fun, but mainly because I've been getting to play with it and explore what it can do. You know, in our library, we do have the Patent and Trademark Resource Center, but also on top of that, we have an opportunity to uh, help our county libraries throughout the state. We had a conference recently, and I had it at our booth, and we had a lot of interest, and I think that we're going to start seeing these a lot more in Wyoming. So maker spaces and 3D printers are a good way to introduce new technology to your patrons. Um, there's a lot of these things that people haven't had a chance to get their hands on, and a library is a great place to showcase that. Again, encouraging creativity. I think libraries are key uh, for that. And to provide a service that isn't necessarily available anywhere else. Um, libraries have been in the forefront of doing that for a lot of, t a lot of years. And I think it's super duper fun. <laughs> so this is the finished model. It's about to finish up right here. Um, it's, it's just doing its last passes across to button it up. But you can see the lines. So it's at a low resolution. I think it's one or three tenths of one millimeter per pass. And I, I don't know how many that is, but it, again, about an hour and a half. And so this was kind of cool. I was able to put it on the LED light of my uh, tablet. I turned it on, and it actually glowed bright, which I think was pretty cool. So anyway, this is my contact info. If you have any questions or, or want to follow up furthermore with this, you can scan that QR code, and it'll put it right in your phone. Um, I'm available anytime. You can drop me an email or give me a call directly. I'm more than happy to discuss any of this. And then I also wanted to mention that this webinar will be posted to the webinar archive in the next uh, day or so. And the video, to watch it if you'd like, you can go to our YouTube page. We have all of our uh, webinars up there. And uh, now let's have some questions if you'd like. Okay, Jesse, your first question is, uh, is it possible to create a monolithic object with two colors using the MakerBot Replicator 2? That's a really good question. Uh, with the Replicator 2, you can, but there's a caveat. You have to do it in a certain order. So, for instance, with our jack-o'-lantern here, I could have changed colors halfway through, but it would be a, a solid stripe, and then it, it would be a, it'd be a hard line horizontally, and then the rest could go up. So, it's funny, actually, we were talking about that yesterday. I was thinking about doing a candy corn. If I stood it on end, I could do the, the orange, the white, and the yellow from the bottom up. So yeah, you can change color. Uh, with this model, there's an option to pause it. And then inside the pause menu, you can change filament. And the, the, it remembers where it was, it drops out, allows you to change your filament, and then go back to it. I've done some baskets with different colors. So yeah, you can. OK. Um, and then uh, we have some more questions coming in. So please, by all means, throw your questions into the chat. Um, so what size is the pumpkin? The pumpkin, that's a, I don't have exact numbers on it. I'm going to say it's about two and three quarter, three inches tall, probably. So, I don't know, smaller than a baseball. Okay. Um, for dual extrusion, do both heads need to print the same object, or can they print different objects? Yeah, so in that example that you saw, there were actually two owls being printed at the same time. So you can... Um, actually print two things at the same time but 
you have to make sure that they don't run into each other. Here we go. So you can see the heads are about, well, I don't know, that's got to be two inches apart, inch and a half apart. So if the two models were much bigger than that, they'd probably bump into each other. But the octopus, you can see, you can actually do two colors on the same model at the same time. Okay. Do you need a dedicated computer with the software on it? You do need a computer with the software on it. Um, I use my work machine here. All it really needs is an SD card, the SD card slot. The software itself is um, really lightweight, and like I say, it's open source, so you can put it on about anything. One of the things that I liked about um, the option of putting it into libraries is if you had a workshop, for instance, about 3D modeling with people, and then you said, go home, download the free software, work on a model and then bring in the SD card, you know, and then we can print it. So that, that saves on, on resources. So um, you don't need like a big bulky machine for the most for the most part. Okay. Do you have any thoughts regarding the differences between activities one might do in a makerspace versus uh, traditional crafting? You know, I don't necessarily. Uh, there's a lot of you know, there's a line in there that I don't know if it needs to be drawn. I think that there's a, there's, there's a lot of the same stuff going on in both spaces, and I, I don't know why they couldn't be uh, combined if you're, you know, I, I don't, I, basically I don't think it needs to be completely separate. I think they augment um, and, and uh, complement each other pretty well. So would, do we, would you consider something that includes uh, knitting materials or sewing machines to be a makerspace? I would, actually, yeah, definitely. I mean, you're creating, basically, I mean. Okay, uh, a couple more questions. Uh, do libraries charge for using these things? Um, uh, yeah, they usually print for the, and I can't speak for all libraries here, but the ones that I've researched, they charge for your material, but you're also um, renting a block of time, or I should say blocking out a window of time on it, because these prints take quite a while. I know a lot of places will print them overnight and you'll come back and pick them up later. Uh, but as far as like if you're sitting down with somebody modeling, you only have so many hours or minutes before the next person gets their chance. But I do know that most of them, just like a copy machine, you print for the paper and the toner that you use. In this case, you print for the filament, which is easy enough because when your model's finished, you just weigh that and you can figure out how much of the filament they've used. And, and again, how much did yeah. the filament cost? So uh, a, a roll is two pounds, and that cost about $48. Okay. Or less, I've found it for less too. And so, like a lot of these models, like my pumpkin, I, it might weigh a quarter of an ounce, I don't even know. So I mean, if you think about how many prints you can get out of that, it's, it's pretty economical. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions come in, but Jesse will stay on as long as uh, you guys have questions. But we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and hope you have a wonderful day. Yep, thank you.